Okay, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, open up to 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 1. Starting at verse 13, it says, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, and be sober, hope to the end, for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the re revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, uh, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. Okay, so this is going to be two of our series right now on biblical manhood, biblical womanhood. And so the two aspects of what is biblical manhood or womanhood that we looked at last week is that man was created to work, and that's mankind, not just men, uh, the gender man, but women as well. That mankind was created to work, and we were created to worship. Okay, so we have innate to us uh, and to our makeup uh, how God created us, we're, we're, we're built, we're designed for working and for worshiping. And then today we're going to look at uh, two things. And the first of which we see here is uh, holiness or purity and then also integrity. So somebody that is to be a, a biblical man or a biblical woman. Uh, now most of what I'm touching upon initially in the series are going to be applicable to both. And then there's going to be a point where I'm going to divide and specifically just things that are just specific to men. And then after that, it'll be a specific, uh, stuff that's specific just, just to women that wouldn't necessarily pertain to men. But these are just common as far as if somebody's going to be biblical in their, in their gender uh, and uh, in masculinity and femininity, they're going to be somebody, and this would be across the board as far as they could work. They're going to be uh, diligent. They're, they're going to be uh, industrious. And then two is that they, they worship, they, have, they, they worship God in particular, I should say. Uh, so if, um, we're created to worship, we're created to work, and then we're created uh, for holiness. Now mind you, the holiness aspect is because of sin, because of the fall, because we are deviated from what God would have us to be by our nature. Okay. And then also by the choices that we make quite often when we, uh, if we're not born again, well, if you're not born again, it's, you're just going and walking in the fashion of, of your old man, of your own lusts. But for those that would have already trusted Jesus as your Savior, you've been freed from that, so you're no longer under bondage to sin. And you're no longer under the bondage or the mastery of the devil or your sin nature. Now, you do have sin still active in your flesh, and that's going to be like that until either you pass, like you die, or the Lord returns, and then we're we're transformed. Okay, and then at that point, you know, we're not going to have to deal with that in our flesh. But up to this point, um, if you're born again, you have sin active in your flesh, but you don't have to obey it in the lust thereof. So in other words, the desires or the passions and those things that sin in your sin nature call for you to do or push you to do or try to motivate you to do, uh, the fact is we are, as it says in Romans 6, as it tells us in 1 Corinthians 15, we're supposed to reckon yourselves indeed dead unto sin, but alive unto Christ, alive unto God. And so we don't have to, uh, if we walk in the Spirit, we should not fulfill the lust of the flesh. We don't have to give in to the temptations. We don't have to give in to those desires. We don't have to give in to sin when it comes calling. We can actually flee it and uh, have victory in our life and, and, and uh, experience uh, God's grace in that area and in many other areas. But we, uh, one thing we're looking at is, okay, we've been called to holiness. So now you're gonna ask, okay, what is holiness? It tells us here very specifically that it's different uh, from what we were, 
okay, and it's, it, it gives a distinction here. It says, okay, as obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the form of us in your ignorance, but he which hath called you is holy, be holy in all manner of conversation. So, okay, so that holiness has an idea of being different from my former lusts or from my former passions. But what is it exactly? What does it mean to be holy? And it's not a very common word that we use like in everyday language. Consecrated. What's that? Consecrated. Concentrated? Consecrated. Oh, consecrated. Okay, what's that mean? Yes, what it means to be holy, that's fine. Yeah, no, what was consecrated mean, though? Uh, holy. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, in this, that's circular reason. Yeah, set apart. Called out? Yeah, set apart. Called out kind of, well, that's a different word, but it's the same, similar concept. Different. It is, it's set apart. There's two aspects to holiness, is, uh, the word itself is basically your, well, it depends on which line you're, you're looking at it too, I should say. Like if you're looking at it in Greek and then it has a, a, the idea of like a weight or substance to it, but there's also like shite, shining bright light to it. Uh, but there's also, it, it's literally, it's like, it's, it's, it's like a cut, like there's a distinction, there's a cut above. What's, what's the opposite of one? Uh, Unholy. It's usually well, if it's in um, if it's in Greek, it would be an alpha privative that's put in the front. You have a little preposition. Well, not, it's not really even a preposition. It's just in English we would consider a, a preposition, a prefix. Yeah, that basically negates the action of whatever the word. So it would be um, yeah. Unholy. Com not holy. Common. Common. Profane. <laughs> so in other words, it's the idea would be. Twisted. Okay. Now, um, holiness is is set apart. Okay. But you are not just set apart from something. You're set apart to something as well. Okay. A lot of times we tend to focus on concentrate on being set apart from, which is good, but we forget that that we are to be set apart to as well. So in other words, we we set ourselves apart from that which would defile us that which basically what God says we should stay away from okay so we, we remove the negative stuff from our life or the stuff that would distract us you could say from from that which is best or better uh, but we're supposed to be focusing our attention on God as a result so in other words a lot of times we may focus on just removing stuff but we don't replace it with anything good or if anything of uh, greater substantial value to it. And what ends up happening is that <laughs> a lot of people end up getting like bitter or frustrated and they don't realize like, hey, listen, I'm, it's a, it's, I'm supposed to be developing a relationship. And we, we set ourselves apart because we want to draw nigh to God. The idea is his qualifier here that he gives is be holy for I am holy. Okay, God's holy. And we are to be, for a number of reasons, one is because we carry his name. If you've been born again this morning, if you trusted Jesus as your Savior, then you are called by his name. He's placed his name on you. You're his child. He's adopted you. And so you are, not only because of the adoption, but by design, we, we're created to glorify God. We're created to basically let the world know who God is. And we don't fulfill that uh, if we aren't holy, if we aren't distinct, if we aren't unique, okay? I like to think of it as, okay, not like anything else or anybody else. Uh, and so that that's also a concept related there with the holiness. Uh, we're in First Peter, First Peter chapter 1, uh, verses 13 through 16. But um, we are supposed to be seeking to draw nigh to God, and we're supposed to be, the idea of our walk with Him is that uh, it's a restoration uh, as much as is possible to, 
to what we had in the garden prior to the fall, okay, which was Adam worked, and we're working, but he walked with God in the cool of the day in the garden. So in other words, he had a relationship that was uh, unobstructed, and we don't necessarily have that. Well, we have that available so much as we are obedient and yielded to him. Uh, it's when we sit, when we make a choice to go ahead and obey the lust of our flesh, that that becomes hindered again. But God's made provision in that. Uh, if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So it is possible to be able to walk in unobstructed, unhindered fellowship. But that's what God wants. So the holiness is a call, not yes, to draw away from the world, to turn from the world, to turn. The Bible tells us that uh, we're not to love, you know. Love not the things of the world. Let me, I'm sorry. I can't believe I had this memorized so long ago, but it's like drawing blank. Um, yeah, love not the world, neither the things of the, uh, that are in the world. For if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the lust, and the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. And so the thing is, uh, those things do nothing for us. They don't benefit us. They might seem pleasurable. And the, the Bible does say that there is pleasure in sin for a season. But it takes you a lot further than what you would want to go. Uh, it, you pay a lot more than what you were willing to pay. It's, it does a lot more damage to your relationship. It does a lot more damage to you. The Bible says... And this, in context, is speaking to believers, not to unbelievers, that the, the wages of sin is death. You know, that uh, in Romans 8, that not only uh, that we live according to the flesh, we shall die. You know, the fact is, the only fruit that lust and pleasure has, basically, is death. Okay, it's, it, it's left to itself, left... Uh, unchecked, un unabated or whatever, it's going to destroy you. Uh, so we should seek to be holy. We should seek holiness. So somebody that is going to be a biblical man or biblical woman is going to pursue holiness. And uh, go to Hebrews 12. Hebrews 12. Okay, verse 14. Now this is in the middle of a context where he's addressing uh, chastisement and spiritual growth. Uh, but verse 14 says, Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Okay. Now that's just kind of thrown in there, and it's in addition to what he had just been letting them know, is that they're supposed to lift up the hands which hang down in feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but rather let it be healed. Okay, in context, what he's addressing there, what he's telling to the Hebrew believers is that they're ready to quit. They are basically discouraged at the fact that they're being persecuted, they're being killed off, and that uh, life is difficult for them uh, at this time because they're being ostracized by their own community, by their own family, and as well as by the Roman government. And so they have persecution basically on two fronts uh, because they've trusted Jesus as their savior. And so what they want to do is they want to say, well, I'm not going to live as uh, fervently as I should for God. I'm not going to live as passionately as I should for God. I'm just going to kind of go with the flow, make it easier on myself so I don't have to you know, experience some of this difficulty and hardship. Maybe it would alleviate some of it. Uh, the problem with that is, is that that's what... That's not what they've been called to, and then God gives grace for that, but they're not availing themselves of that grace. And um, he tells them in that that uh, they're not supposed to uh, despise the chastisement of the Lord. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. And so he tells them, yeah, now no chastisement for the present seem joyous, but grievous, but afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness to them that are exercised thereby. Um, and so that... Um, the persecution that they're experiencing is permitted by God. It's not sent by Him, but it's permitted by God in their life to exercise them, to develop them spiritually so that they would grow. Now, in the midst of that, He tells them, 
beyond just the fact that you're supposed to, in other words, strengthen yourself. Don't quit. Don't give up. Uh, it says, follow peace with all men and holiness. Okay, that's pretty interesting. <laughs> he tells them to follow holiness. And here's why. It says, without which no man shall see the Lord. Now, I know it seems kind of silly. He's talking to people that are believers, right? Why would he be telling a believer, hey, you need to follow holiness or else you're not going to see the Lord? Okay, yeah, but we're born again, right? So, I mean, we're going to heaven. So we're going to see him at some point. So why wouldn't we, what? Fellowship. Yeah, key. I can't see God active or working in my life without holiness, okay? I need peace as well. Obviously, I'm supposed to seek peace with all men. Uh, but the thing is, God's not going to work in my life as he wants to. Or as I shackle him. My unbelief shackles him, and then my lack of holiness is going to shackle him. It's one of the things that we read about in Ephesians that, uh, you know, grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, uh, whereby you're sealed until the day of redemption. Uh, and then he goes off and he names some things in particular that would grieve him. Uh, and then we're supposed to not quench the Spirit as well. Uh, lack of holiness, lack of holiness is going to quench him, it's going to grieve him. And we shackle God's ability to be able to work in our life. In other words, He's God. He's the creator of the universe. He holds, by Him all things consist, okay? <laughs> I have the breath and the strength and the ability to be able to do anything right now uh, as far as what, he, what He's permitted, what He's given because of Him. But, um, well, as, as in with unbelief, as in with unbelief in particular, where it said that Jesus did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. Uh, I can't see God. I can't see God work. I can't see God's hand. I can't see God's power in my life without holiness. Okay, I'm not gonna. <laughs> I'm not gonna have availed to me uh, the resources at hand that are at my disposal by God that He desires for me uh, without my personal holiness. Okay, so we as uh, those that would seek to be biblical in our masculinity and our femininity are to pursue holiness. We're supposed to seek holiness. We're not going to be able to see God without it. We're not going to also uh, be fulfilling our purpose, which is we're, we're to glorify Him uh, with it. Go to 1 Thessalonians also. Um, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians 4. Now the word holiness is not mentioned here, but the concept, okay, the concept is addressed here. Okay, now this is an aspect of it. This isn't the entire aspect, but this is an aspect of it that is addressed. Okay, so at the beginning of verse 1. It says, furthermore, then... We beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as ye have received of us, how ye ought to walk and please God, so ye would abound more and more. For ye know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus, uh, for this is the will of God, even your sanctification, okay, that you should abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor, not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles which know not God, uh, that no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter, uh, because that the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we have also forewarned you and testified. For God had not called you... Well, actually, he does mention it. I'm sorry. <laughs> I was thinking just the verses above. I, I, For some reason, this one had slipped, but he does mention it here. He says, For God had not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. Okay, he therefore that despises... Uh, Despises not man, but God, who hath also given unto us his Holy Spirit. All right. There's a lot here. <laughs> okay. This is one aspect that if you read much of the New Testament, you're going to see a surprising amount uh, mentioned over and over and over and over and over and over again. 
uh, not just in the Gospels, but in spe specifically in Acts and in any of Paul's writings, uh, though not limited to Paul's writings, um, but the, in particular just fornication. That is mentioned uh, countless times, and that they're supposed to flee it, uh, flee useful lusts. Uh, we're supposed to avoid it, that we've not, obviously in this portion, we've not been called unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. In Ephesians, that we're told that uh, those things that are done in secret by them, that it's a shame to even speak of them. Uh, but this is one aspect that, uh, in particular, of holiness, though, though not just limited, but this is one aspect that is very important, especially... Uh, in our area and in, in our culture here, um, I, w I wouldn't just say locally, but just in the, in, in the U.S., uh, how much immorality and, and and sexual stuff is like glorified and, and made to seem as commonplace, and then just all the perversions that come from all that. Um, the fact is, uh, God made that relationship. God created that. Uh, but it, he limited it to the marriage bond. So in other words, it's fine. In Hebrews, we're told that marriage is honorable and all, and the bed undefiled. Okay, so it's something that God had created, and it's God created for a husband and a wife. Now, outside of that, what people have done, um, just out of sheer rebellion, and just the influence of, well, not exclusively the influence, the influence of Satan, but uh, in part also because of the influence of Satan. Uh, is they've twisted and perverted in all kind of ways. And so you got folks that run around uh, multiple wives. Uh, you got folks um, run around and just do all, whatever. I, I could go off all day probably naming all kind of weird twisted perversions and stuff like that. Um, anymore, it, there's nothing that probably hasn't even been uh, thought of. People are trying to cross all kind of crazy boundaries now uh, just for shock value. Um, just, well, we're told in Romans also that because when they knew not God, they glorified him neither as God or were thankful, um, but became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened and wherefore God gave them up to a reprobate mind uh, to do those things which were unseemly. And so from that point, because of their rejection of the truth and rejection of the knowledge of God, uh, he just said, okay, fine, boom. He took his hands off from intervening in their life, and they just go wild to do whatever, you know, whatever's in their heart to want to pursue. And that's where a lot of this perversion comes from. But if we're going to be biblical, if we're going to be a biblical man or a biblical woman, we, one, are going to have God's mindset and God's attitude. And this is an aspect of holiness. Uh, it's crucial for us to, to have in our thinking, uh, and that is this. Um, I am to keep myself for whoever God would have my spouse to be. All right, so I don't, I don't sleep around. All right, I don't. First Corinthians is good for a man not to touch a woman. <laughs> I don't even feel comfortable doing that. Uh, as far as um, you know, you don't, you just, you just, you just don't go there. You don't bring yourself up to a position. We're, we're supposed to abstain from all appearance of evil. You don't do things, put yourself in a position where you violate. Uh, obviously, God's clear command here to flee fornication, uh, abstain from fornication. But also, you want to live in such a way and think in such a way that you. Uh, you don't want to promote that either. It's one thing, okay, yeah, I'm fine, I keep it, you know, I'm, I keep myself. Uh, but we want to, um, mind you, that the Bible says of the church that the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. <coughs> so, what is a gate? Entry point. What's that? An entry point. Okay, it is an entry point. A limiter. What is it? A limiter. Uh, <coughs> it allows some in and some out, and keeps some out. Okay, if in warfare, what would, what would a gate be? It would be defensive. 
Yes. Okay. <laughs> exactly. All right. <laughs> it's not an offensive structure. It's a defensive structure. Okay. Um, so the church is to be on the offensive. Uh, yes, it does limit, and it is an entry point. Uh, but the fact is, the church is to be on the offensive. The gates of hell shall not prevail against us. In other words, God, uh, Saint, whatever Satan has as these defenses are not to prevail over us. Now, mind you, it's because we are to be empowered by the Holy Spirit of God, and it's in God's strength, as it tells us in Ephesians, that uh, we're supposed to put on the whole armor of God. And then, uh, finally, finally, my brother, be strong in the power of uh, in the power of the Lord and in the power of His might. Uh, and it's His might that we are able to do things. And it's His power that we're able to accomplish anything and see anything done. It's, it's not because of us, but it's rather because of Him. Uh, but the fact is, it's a def it's, that's a defensive measure, and the Bible says of it that you know they're not going to prevail against the church. And so we should be on the offensive for the Lord, I believe, in reaching people and then trying to transform uh, and affect the culture for the Lord in a positive manner. Okay, so, uh, I'm sorry, we're in 1 Thessalonians 4. 1 Thessalonians 4, for those that are just coming in. 1 Thessalonians 4. Okay. Uh, so, sanctification. Okay, that's another big term. What does that mean? Uh, it has a similar root as in holiness, but it's it's to make as a saint, okay. But yeah, it's 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 a cleanliness thing. So you're uh, God's cleansing, God's desire for us from when we're born again uh, is to cleanse us. Uh, he's trying to purify His church, and we we obviously are members within a church, uh, not just a local assembly, but within God's body. Uh, is that He's cleansing us. He's, he's He's uh, trying to make us as, as uh, pure and spotless. Now, we, we are, as far as when we receive him, pure. Uh, but as far as in practice, I'm talking about in practice, that is uh, trying, to, trying to cleanse us, trying to change our thinking so that we would live, live pure, live pure in our lives. Okay, and then he wants us here, not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles which know not God. Um... And then that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. Okay, that's another thing that we don't really have uh, in this society that we see very often. There's a sense of shame or honor. Uh, and then that which they do have or hold in high esteem is something that is usually pretty twisted or perverted and uh, glorifies Satan rather than it really does try to glorify God as what we've been created to do. Okay, but as, as messed up <laughs> as I or anybody else may be, but the fact is, if you, if you trusted Jesus as your Savior, you're called by His name, and He's cleansed you, and He's desiring to actively cleanse you daily. And we are to adopt His mindset and mentality on this issue. And so, uh, fornication is something to be just avoid it altogether. We're supposed to hold his estimation of it as it's a perversion, it's a twisting of what he's designed. Uh, and so any expression of it, uh, be it through, the, the, the term itself is very broad. So you can, it, it's not just sex outside of marriage, it's just basically any sexual perversion which follows whatever, transvestitism, homosexuality, bestiality, you name it, whatever, whatever is out there. Uh, all that is to be viewed in the light of God's outlook and heart on it. And he says, that's, that's not what I created you for. Okay? Your body is his temple. Okay? And so the fact is that the Holy Spirit of God lives in you and he uh, if you yield to him, will keep you from uh, fulfilling whatever passions or desires that your flesh would want to uh, carry out. But if we're going to be biblical or, or in, our, our, in, our, in our mindset, in our mentality, as far as uh, what is biblical man or biblical woman, uh, fornication and all and every aspect of it is something that we should repudiate, is something that we should 
avoid is something that we should hold in very low esteem. We should view it as what God says it is, and that is sin, something that could be avoided altogether whatsoever. So we don't allow ourselves to be in, uh, to indulge in that. We don't allow ourselves, uh, obviously, to participate in that. Uh, and we are supposed to pursue, look, it says here, um, his intent with it beyond also that we should know how to possess our vessel in sanctification and honor says that no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter. Okay, because that the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we have also forewarned and testified. So in other words, God isn't just preoccupied with you being holy. He's preoccupied with others that are going to be in your sphere of influence that could be affected by you being holy as well. And so the fact is, you have a sphere of influence and you have a measure of influence. And you're supposed to use that to encourage those uh, that either are brethren to live holy or to those that are not yet to, hey, seek to know the Lord. Because the fact is, you were created to glorify Him. You were created for a greater, higher purpose than defiling yourself in the manner that, you seek to, that you're doing. You know? God didn't create, you know, your hands and your mouth. <laughs> you know, these, these lips are to praise Him for, you know, to, to speak positive messages. I mean, yeah, we're supposed to warn and rebuke, uh, but at the same time, you know, they're, they're, to share, they're to share the Lord. They're to share His precious promises with Him, okay? The strength that I have wasn't given to me so I could run and do something wicked and perverted with it. It was given to me so I could work for God and I could glorify Him. You know, sing with my legs, with my feet. Um, I mean, we think, okay, yeah, it's a kid song. Uh, you know, not, not only be careful little feet where you go and be careful little eyes what you see, but the fact is that, hey, that's just as applicable to us. And even more so this day and age when uh, there's, it seems like there's no restrictions or no filters uh, on anything anymore. But God's created us for a higher purpose, for something greater than just defiling ourselves. Uh, and so if we're going to be biblical in our mentality, if we're going to be a biblical man, biblical woman, we're supposed to pursue holiness, abstain from fornication. Uh, go to, you know what? So that is the first aspect that we're looking at, okay? Holiness. We're created for holiness. Last week we saw, okay, we're created for worship, we're created for work, uh, we're created to be holy. We're, or we, we are to be holy, rather, I should say. We are, we are to be holy. Uh, that wouldn't have been an issue if we hadn't sinned, but because of sin, it's, a, it's an issue now, so then we're to be holy. And then, Psalm 1. Psalm 1. I'm going to start reading off a bunch of verses. I'm going to read here because it's kind of best. Well, you know, no, 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 no. Wait, 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 wait. I should go to Job. Job. Job chapter 1. <coughs> okay, Job chapter 1. Okay, there was a man in the land of us whose name was Job, and that man was perfect and upright and one that feared God and eschewed evil. Okay, or basically he turned from it. Okay, and there were born unto him seven sons and three daughters. His substance also was 7,000 sheep and 3,000 camels and 500 yoke of oxen, 500 she asses and very uh, great households, so that this man was the greatest of all the men of the East. Greatest as in his substance. He was the richest. Okay, and his sons went and feasted in their houses, everyone. Uh, his day, and sent and called for uh, their three sisters to eat and drink with them. And it was so that when the days of their feasting were gone about, that Job sent and sac uh, sanctified them, and rose up early in the morning, and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them. Uh, all, for Job said, It may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus did Job continually. Uh, now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also, uh, came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro um, in the earth and from walking up and down in it. 
Does it sound familiar? It's First Peter 5. <laughs> uh, and then, uh, the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in all the earth? A perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil. Now that's God's assessment of him. Okay, then Satan answered and said, Lord, uh, the Lord, uh, Answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for not or for nothing? Hast thou not made a hedge about him, and about his house, and about all that he hath on every side? Uh, thou hast blessed the work of his hands, and his substance is increased in the land. Uh, but put forth thine hand now, and touch all that he hath, and he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto him, or unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power. Only upon himself put not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. Okay, and then we're going to read about how all his children were going to be killed, all his substance was going to be robbed, and then he was going to lose basically his household. And then, But they were spared a servant from each of one of the calamities that transpired that was a witness, and then he came back and they told him of the report. So he received the report of all the damages that, he had, taken, that had taken place in his life uh, at that time. Um... Skip down to verse 20. It says, Job arose and rent his mantle and shaved his head and fell down and upon the ground and worshiped and said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb. Naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And then in all this, Job <coughs> said not nor charge God foolishly. Okay, so he didn't, he didn't speak evil of God. Okay, so and then again, we're going to see a, a similar account here later following all this. Again, uh, there was a day when the Lord, uh, when the sons of God came to present, uh, present themselves before the Lord. And Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. Uh, and then God addresses Satan, and then Satan says basically the same response I've been walking in, or to, to and from it, uh, all in it, all up and down in it. And then God asks Satan, as hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, and a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? Notice this, and he says, and he still holdeth fast his integrity. He still holdeth fast his integrity. Although thou movest me against him to destroy him without cause. Uh, skip down to verse 9. What's going to happen is, is that he's going to allow Satan to afflict him with a disease, or with diseases, and then he's diseased after, uh, after the loss of everything that he had. Okay, so he's lost all his financial wealth, he's lost his, his children, he's lost basically anything that he would have had that would have been of any value or substance or preciousness in his life outside of his wife. And then now he loses his health. Uh, and then, in verse 9, and then, then his wife said unto him, Dost thou still retain thine integrity? Curse God and die. But he said unto her, Thou, speak it as one, uh, thou speakest as one of the foolish women, Speaketh, what shall we receive good at the hand of the Lord God, uh, at the hand of God, and shall we not receive evil? Uh, and all this did not Job sin with his lips. And his, his three friends are going to come. There was one word that was mentioned twice within a few verses of each other. Uh, one is we see that his wife says of him, Do you retain your integrity? And then we see God's assessment of him that says, that although you've moved me to Satan, he's, he, although you've moved me to try and destroy him, uh, he still retaineth his integrity. All right. So if we're going to be biblical men or biblical women, we're going to have integrity. Okay. We're going to follow holiness. We're going to be holy. We're going to seek to be holy, and then we're to have integrity. I'm just going to read off a bunch of verses, particularly in Proverbs. Uh, he that walketh uprightly walketh surely, but he that perverteth his ways shall be known. Better is the poor that walketh in his uprightness than he that is perverse in his ways, though he be rich. The integrity of the upright shall guide them, but the perverseness of the transgressor shall destroy him or destroy them. Better is the poor that walketh in his, his integrity than he that is perverse in his lips uh, and is a fool. Okay, the just man walketh in his integrity; his children are blessed after, after him. Uh, this one doesn't mention the word integrity in it, but the concept is there. Okay, to do justice and judgment is more acceptable uh, to the Lord than sacrifice. That sounds like a 
almost a, almost a <coughs> verbatim quote for uh, First Samuel 15, and then also uh, in uh, Micah 6 that uh, He has shown the old man what is good and what the Lord required for thee, but to do justly, to love mercy, and then to walk humbly with thy God. All right. So if we're going to be biblical men, we're going to be biblical women. Uh, biblical manhood and biblical womanhood would be that of having integrity. Now, what is integrity? Okay, we've mentioned it quite a bit, uh, but what does that actually mean? What does that, what does that mean? I know, I, I, what's that? You're honest. This is the only <coughs> All right, I'm just going to read off an English <coughs> definition of it, uh, but it carries actually more than that. Um, the quality of being honest and having strong moral principles and moral uprightness. Uh, and then the state of being whole and undivided. That the second the second definition that I just read is literally uh, more accurate with, with Hebrew. Uh, as far as that that the, the little word used for in, in the Hebrew, uh, the Hebrew definition of integrity. So in other words, there, there's not just a purity, but there's a there's a straightness, there's a rectitude, there's a there's not a twisting, there's not a there's not a the, the word perverted, even though it has a sexual connotation, literally just it means twist, twisted. Like when you see it in scripture, especially in the Old Testament, the, the idea of it, it's, it's twisted, it's not, it's crooked, it's, it's not from what it should be. Okay, it's turned aside from, from the path of what, uh, from what it should be. So integrity, uh, ideally it's just, it's an inner mentality, an inner heart attitude, uh, mindset, uh, of, of, of purpose, of rightness, uh, of justice, okay, of doing right, seeking to do right. In other words, you, you're committed to God. You're committed to not just, okay, yeah, as a <coughs> God, I give myself to you, but rather to God's principles, to God's mindset, to God's outlook. And so what we want is we want to be people of integrity, okay? If you're going to be somebody that is biblical as a man or biblical as a woman, you're to have Bible integrity, you know, you're supposed to have godly integrity. Uh, we would have, I guess, integrity that would be to us. Or it would, you would, people would say, loosely, I guess you would say, oh, they have no integrity. You do, it's just twisted or perverted, I should say. If it's not godly, if it's not pursuant or, uh, you know, subservient to God's design for it. And what God's design, desire for, obviously, is, okay, avoiding fornication, but doing justice, doing ju uh, judgment, doing right. Okay, there, there is a such thing as absolute right and wrong, and you're committed to it, and you seek that out. And so, if we're going to be biblical in our, in our, in our, in our, in our genders, in, in our outlook, uh, we should seek holiness, and we should have integrity. Okay, we should pursue it. We should develop our integrity as a godly one. All right, one that is not obviously okay. We would think of things of you can go through literally the whole book of Proverbs and anything as far as what God would say is the just man or what God commends in a just person. Uh, that's why I was going to turn to Psalm 1. Was it's, it talks about blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And then here is the product of that meditation, and the product of the adherence to that, is that he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, that bringeth forth his fruit in his season, and his leaf also shall not wither, but whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Okay. Now I, that's not just limited to necessarily like monetary benefit, or physical benefit, but uh, as it said about the just man that he walketh in his integrity and his children are blessed after them is that you have things that are not of a tangible nature that you can affect for generations down the road by having godly integrity and if we're going to be biblical as men and women we need to pursue that and we need to pursue holiness because otherwise uh, all we're going to do is we're going to fail to fulfill our purpose that we've been created for. And we will end up having to stay in the shame. All right.
I've gone a little over and it's kind of, um, there's still a lot more I wanted to say about that. Does anybody, did anybody have any questions? All right, okay, no questions. So uh, we'll be continuing to look at this and then other aspects as far as um, next week, I think we're gonna address a little bit more, what specifically some of what um, what is in this book. And then um, we're just messing. <coughs> Thank <laughs> you.